This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. This is the Doc and Jock Podcast. You're listening to episode 191. Thank you. I hope you found it very easily across our various platforms. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my cousin, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? You got your plan set for opening day, Friday? You know this. It's all set, huh? Come on now. Yes, we'll we'll discuss that. We've got plenty more to talk about. I mean, I'm still feeling the effects of WrestleMania. We're going to get into a little bit of that. Uh, Also, big event this weekend, not not WrestleMania, but we had uh, the conclusion of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network Bracket Challenge. So uh, we're going to have our our little interview, our one-on-one, if you will, with uh, with our winner of our tournament. So uh, that's going to be good. This this whole podcast is just jam-packed, bro. It's all good, man. You know, around this time of Detroit sports, you would think that we'd be getting excited for the Red Wings playoff push, the Pistons playoff push. But at this point in time, all the focus is going to be, and that's where we'll start, is the Detroit Tigers because the Wings and Pistons, they're in rebuild mode. They're basically going to ride out the string. I mean, when you look at the statistics, the Pistons have, what, maybe a 2% chance of getting into the postseason. The Red Wings are mathematically eliminated. Everyone's going to be looking forward to Sunday and the finale at Joe Louis Arena. So hockey, basketball, not really strong on our radar right now, but strong on everybody's radar, the Detroit Tigers. And unfortunately for them, they're battling the weather out there in Chicago. It's been a weird start to the year where you have two cancellations in one game. Yeah, it's uh, a little bit odd, but I was going to ask you this. Do you think that it'd probably be a good idea to maybe... This this always comes up around this time of year because there's always a, a ton of games that either get postponed or pushed back or they've got to deal with inclement weather. Do you think it'd be smart if Major League Baseball possibly started the season a week or two later, maybe just kind of pushed everything back? I mean... Look, I know when World Series rolls around, we're already into into October, and you're sitting there, you're creeping up on November, so it does kind of stretch out the season, make it a little bit longer, and now you're playing into those colder months where you're probably going to be dealing with some snow, but I mean, geez louise, it's like every time you turn around, opening day for whatever team is getting postponed because of either weather or because of snow. And when you look at it for the Detroit Tigers, because the game versus Chicago on Wednesday was canceled, it's not moved to Thursday. It's not moved for a doubleheader right away in the city they're already in. Now they're going to play a doubleheader at the tail end of May. And when you look at their schedule at the end of May, oh my gosh, it's tough where the entire month, because the Tigers only play at home 10 times and they only have a handful of days off. In a Major League Baseball schedule, they only have a handful of days off per month anyway. So the month of May is going to be really brutal where they're not going to be at home they're going to be playing a lot of games, and there's not going to be a lot of days off. So I say I'm ready for the start of the season. I was kind of jonesing for it because spring training is long. They play a lot of games in spring training, and that's why I guess they had the day off on Tuesday just in case there was an issue on opening day on Monday. But in the end, you can't beat uh, Mother Nature, and all they'll do is schedule double headers. So I would nix that idea. I just think that you start the year first week of April because – At the tail end of it, let's say the Tigers were ever to get back to glory, and now you're going to play what? Games into the middle of November? You damn near could have snow outs. Exactly. So that's the problem. You can't win either way, right? Well, the baseball season's so long anyways. I mean, geez, 162 games? Come on. The the Tigers find themselves in a really weird spot, though, as they enter into Friday's opening day game here in Detroit, where they might be 1-0. They've only played one game because there's the possibility that that today's game is going to be rained out as well because there's just Chicago's just getting hit with this storm that won't seem to let up. It, it, it's weird because on Monday, they had 100% for a chance of rain. They were able to get the game in on Tuesday. Wednesday's game, they had a 75% chance of rain, and they sat there and they, they called off the game before it ever started. They called it off at, what, 9 in the morning, I think you said. And then today's game, 
th there's a huge possibility that they don't even get this underway and that they get to, to sit there and play because they're still getting the tail end of this storm. Whatever Chicago is getting hit with, we're going to get hit with some of it. And it kind of has me scratch my head. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm hoping that as the as the that that front makes its way over the water, it kind of dissipates a little bit, and as it kind of creeps in through Grand Rapids and makes it through the central part of Michigan, it kind of tails off. And that way, opening day's not ruined, and it's not a complete washout. And immediately, a lot of people were messaging us on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast. They were asking, "Whoa." If the games got canceled earlier in the week, does that mean Fulmer's still not pitching on Friday? Have they moved it around yet? As of this recording, they've moved some of the, obviously, the pitching rotation around, but Fulmer is still, at this point in time, pitching on Friday. Now, whether today's game does get canceled, if that affects it, because you really don't want to really reshuffle the pitching rotation, but I really like, as is, the way it shakes out now, because now you get, potentially, Fulmer and Zimmerman going up against Boston in a four-game series where... You look at Boston uh, up and down, what they got, that's going to be a fun series right away to start the year. So for me, I'm pretty much okay with how this started. Game one was nice to watch. I was really into it. Kind of got to already critique Brad Ausmus, but it's always good to start the year with a 6-3 victory against a team like the White Sox. When you look at them, oh my goodness, they're going to lose 100 games. They're going to have a fire sale probably really quickly. The pitcher that you saw on opening day for the Chicago White Sox probably going to be moved if any team has an injury right away because the White Sox, whoo, they're in full rebuild. They got a couple pieces, but not enough to, if you look at it, not enough to compete with the Tigers. Yeah, Jose Quintana is, is probably their best pitcher, and you've seen what the Tigers did to him. I mean, they were able to sit there and go yard on him three different times. Jacoby Jones looks pretty solid out there in the outfield and especially at the at, at plate, so that's a good deal. The Chicago White Sox are going to be a brutal, brutal team this year which makes me feel good as a Tigers fan. I mean, you're going to play them 19 times over the course of the season, so I'm not going to say it's going to be 19 wins, but you should win the majority of those games. Um, Minnesota Twins are a, a team that's on the rebuild as well. Again, you're going to play them 19 times. Again, more wins for you. Cleveland it looks to be a strong team as well as Kansas City looks to be uh, in, in the hunt this year and, and going to be a little bit of a feisty contender. But Vegas has the Tigers' win total set at 83. So are you thinking, especially with these teams like Chicago and Minnesota, do you think the Tigers have a chance to go over that, or do you think it's going to be under? I mean, you've already been talking about Brad Ausmus, and we've only been doing this podcast now for, what, five minutes? And you're already sitting there throwing stones at Brad Ausmus. So uh, where, where's your head at? The way I look at it, it was a very great debut for the Detroit Tigers. I mean, who are some of the people that we're looking at? Nicholas Castellanos, boom, hits a home run. Isn't that a little bit weird calling him Nicholas? <laughs> it is a little it, weird. It's, it's, it's like a mouthful. Nicholas Casti Castellanos. Hey, like, I'm struggling to say it. Can we just call him Nicky C? He had a good start to the season. Jacoby Jones, what's he going to do offensively? Because his strengths are going to be in the outfield. He hit a home run. Justin Verlander, can he be the JV of old? Can he crank it back up? Can he get guys out? He went strong. I think he had 10 Ks. 10 Ks. Unbelievable start to the Ks season in, for him. in six and a third. That, that's pretty outstanding right there. And it had a little bit of drama in that, you know, you throw Shane Green out there from the bullpen. Anytime Brad Ausmus is going to call and walk out to the mound and call for the bullpen, we're all going to be a little bit nervous. Shane Green, right away, two guys on, two guys, you know, he faced two batters, two guys were already on base. So boom, yanks him out, brings in K-Rod, and it, he handles the business and earns himself a save. So you look at it as a whole. And you go, what's the best way to kind of make up for a crappy bullpen is to have a solid offense. If you give them six runs, you're going to have a lot of success this year. So for game one, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was nicely paced. Um, it was nice to see that five run inning. It relieves a lot of stress when you whenever, you know, Brad Ausmus decides to go to the bullpen. He used Justin Verlander properly, 103 pitches. And all in all, it's a great start to the season. A lot of things that you can take away on a positive note. Very few things that you can go, you know, you can be hypercritical about. Justin Upton was replaced because of an injury, but you had some situations where you could have bunted. And in those situations, those are minor details, things you could nitpick about with Brad Ausmus. But in the end, a 6-3 victory, you go out there, you handle your business. In a game that, when you play the White Sox, you got to thump them. Does this team strike you as a team that's going to be doing a lot of bunting? Because it, <laughs> no. it, it's totally, again, we talk about it every single year. It, it's built like a power softball team. They're, this is a team that has to hit home runs in order for them to be successful. And that being said, I think they're going to be able to do that over the course of the year. I mean, look, the outfield on this team is built for power. When, when J.D. Martinez comes back, that dude is a, 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 a plus 20 home run kind of guy every single season. Right, Justin Upton, he looks to be much more comfortable through spring training this year 
Uh, it looks like at the tail end of last year, he really kind of found his groove and found his way with this team. That guy I'm predicting is going to be a plus 20 home run type of dude. You know what Miguel Cabrera is going to bring? He's going to be at least 30 plus home runs. Uh, as long as Victor Martinez's knees and ankles can hold up, that guy is usually a 30 to 25 to 30 home run kind of guy. Nick Castellanos is bringing so much confidence to the plate right now. He's just going to scream the ball all over the park. So I'm going to say he's going to be 25 to 30 home runs as well. Uh, Ian Kinsler, that guy's usually right around 20. So, I mean, this team has power. They are built for power. I can see them just blasting the ball all over the place. What I took out of that first game against Chicago was that this team was able to get guys home that were on base. And all that being said, I think they're going to go over the 83 game mark. I, no I, doubt. I yep. believe that they're going to be they're going to be in contention for a playoff spot this year. You know anybody in Vegas? We could just throw a couple hundred bones out there. I really think it's a good bet. If the if the Vegas total right now is 83, I think it's a pretty safe bet. They're going to be mid to high 80 wins. I, I yeah, I would assume. I would say at least 87. I mean, that's where I'm kind of going. I had with it 85 this. and 77. This okay, year. And, and I I think that right there might be enough for them to to maybe sneak in as a wild card. Look, mm-hmm. Cleveland is going to be a, a, a tough a, a tough number against this team. And Cleveland had their number last year. I mean, it, if you sat there and you went back, and if they only won 50% of those games against Cleveland, they'd have sat there and they'd have been first in their division, and they would have sat there and been in for the playoffs. So I think this year you're going to see a little bit of a different team against Cleveland. I think they're going to win some of those games a lot more than they won last year. Chicago looks like, looks like a dumpster fire. And you said yourself, there's the possibility for an early sell-off there. Minnesota, again, a team that's always on the rebuild, so you should win the majority of those games as well. You should be able to take care of this division. It, Kansas City and Cleveland are going to be the two, you know, the two tough roads to hoe there, and I think the Tigers can win the majority of those games. So I don't see any reason why you wouldn't sit there and go bet your life savings on over 83 games. So of the guys that performed well, like Jacoby Jones, like Castellanos, like Verlander, who impressed you the most in Game 1? I mean, it had to be Jacoby Jones. I mean, th- this is... Center field was a position that both you and I were totally nervous about and, and totally uh, on guard. Like, what's going to happen? Who's going to fill that role? And going into spring training, Jacoby Jones wasn't a guy that I thought was going to be able to win that starting position. I thought Mikey Matuk was going to win that. In the end, Jacoby Jones sits there, has a really good spring, plays a lot of different roles for this team, and, and is able to capture it. it. Was did a really nice job at the plate. And you've seen some of that translate in this game against Chicago where he was able to hit a three-run jack. So Jacoby Jones probably stood out the most, and then after that it was Verlander. He was extremely efficient. I mean, 10 strikeouts. Look, I know Chicago's not very good. I understand. But the one thing about Justin Verlander is he usually starts the season slow. He usually gets knocked around his first couple games. Um, He looks very average, usually his first five games out. He looked like a dominant Justin Verlander out there. 10 strikeouts, was getting the ball where he wanted it. His competitiveness and his little bit of anger kind of got the best of him there where, where he threw the ball away. But other than that, I, I thought he looked really good. I mean, he threw 103 pitches. He was he was efficient. He was effective. And there are things, of course, he needs to work on, but it's the first game of the season, and I like what I'm seeing out of the first game of the season from him. No doubt about it. It was a nice performance all the way around. I, I, I agree with you. Jacoby Jones, a player that you want to see contribute offensively because what are his strengths he's he's a pure athlete he has speed but he's got to contribute you can't go out there in this offense and bat 200 he won't make the lineup day in day out you'll start getting replaced I like Nicholas Castellanos 100 percent you know if he's a guy that's going to be on this roster and he can take another step then you're potentially looking at an all-star and that's something that you could say you know what would be a great accomplishment for Nicholas because what were we saying about him many people were starting to call him a bust and we were looking at it and going, okay, what is it going to look like when Brad Osmus has to call on the bullpen? And, and obviously now the recipe for success is going to be to have solid quality starts from your starters, have them go six, seven innings. I would have liked to have maybe kept the game a little bit closer to see what would have happened if um, you know the game would have been a one-run game, what would have happened had uh, Shane Green put those two guys on, and then you have uh, K-Rod come in. Does he give up the extra runs when the pressure's on? But in a game where you got extra runs, you got the lead, it made for an easier situation to get the first save for K-Rod. But in essence, what's going to be the factor that's going to allow us to evaluate how good this team is going to be? It's going to be the defense. It's going to be how well the pitchers do. Because this offense, 
if healthy, it kind of looks like an offense that's going to be able to score four to six runs. You know, they're going to have lulls. They're going to have situations where throughout the course of a season, different guys are going to slump. But collectively, that lineup looks good. One through six. And once J.D. returns, you're only going to have a couple guys like Iglesias and McCann that are going to be holes offensively in that lineup. So pretty good start. And like I said, don't sleep on the Detroit Tigers making a run here and there, maybe early in the year, because I really do think they might use the rallying cry of, hey, this is our last go round. Let's bond. Let's do the best that we can and see what happens. But when you look at it collectively as a whole, it's not their fault. It's just there's other teams in the American League with a little bit more talent. But how well does perseverance and heart take you? I'm looking forward to seeing this year um, where the Detroit Tigers are going to go. But I wanted to ask you, how are you experiencing watching the Tigers? Are you going to be doing it more through the radio, uh, television, Fox Sports Go, or are you watching it on Fox Sports Live on TV? How are you going to experience most of the Tigers games this year? You know, that first game was kind of a mix. I started off watching it on television, then I had to uh, head out to work in the afternoon for a couple hours. So I was listening on the radio, and then I actually got to work. Uh, Everything got canceled uh, because there was some maintenance going on, and uh, I was able to go back home and finish watching the game on television. So it'll be a mix between television and radio. Yeah, because I'm going to give a quick review here. I started to watch it on the computer here. The majority of the times, the games, if they're going to be in the afternoon, I'll be watching it on the computer here in between visits at the office or in between podcasts. But watching it on TV, they already started with the PR and laying it on thick. Because that's what I was kind of listening to in terms of, you know, what percentage are they giving like baseball knowledge? What percentage are they just fluffing up the Detroit Tigers and talking about all the strengths and all the things. And Rod Allen and Mario do a good job, but it's just a little bit too thick on the PR versus what I like. So the radio side does a little bit better job. They definitely do it, both sides, because they're partners with the Tigers. But for me, I started noticing, wow, Rod Allen, when Nick Castellanos hit the home run, the first words out of his mouth were, Nicholas is going to have a big year. And he was so excited. And, you know, watching the pregame and all the spin, they talked about the challenges and it was pretty fair, but it was just a little bit slanted too much for my liking in terms of all the positivity and the glowing reviews. So I think for me, my preference probably the rest of the year is maybe watch a handful of games on Fox Sports Detroit on the app here on the computer and the rest on the radio. I just think that's just the best way to watch it. Um, Theater of the mind, as they describe it. Not into all the maybe pomp and circumstance of the PR on the television side. It's a little bit thick for me. Radio, it's a little bit more reasonable, and uh, I like what Dan and Jim Price do on the uh, on the ticket there when they broadcast. The one thing I can say is that we're super lucky to have commentary teams a- as solid as both of them are, whether it be on television or on the radio. I totally get where you're coming from, and I understand it, but I think we're really lucky to to have the, the teams that we have and the squads that we have, so that works out great for us. Do you have any bold predictions going into the season? My bold prediction will be Michael Fulmer will be in the Cy Young conversation, maybe late in the year. I think he's going to be in the neighborhood of 18 wins, and he's going to be somebody that is going to be prominent and take the next step. A lot of people are talking about a second-year slump, but I really feel like he's a gamer. I feel like that's a guy that is going to buck trends. I think he's going to go out there and develop pitches. He's going to be a gamer, and I'm looking for him to have 18 wins and to be in the Cy Young conversation, especially coming off of an AL Rookie of the Year campaign. That's pretty bold. I think that J.D. Martinez, no matter where this team is at, they will trade him sometime around the deadline. And that's purely Ooh. for it's purely because of his contract. He's already making $15 million. He's going to want more money. And his production is going to, to, to basically say, yes, he deserves to be paid more. So this team slashing payroll like it is, I believe that they'll end up trading him for something um, instead of getting nothing at the end of the year. Also, I think Justin Verlander will lead the American League in strikeouts this year. He looks like he has returned to the old form of Justin Verlander, that dominant pitcher. On top of that, something that he didn't have when he was sitting there winning Cy Youngs and in contention for Cy Youngs, it looks as though he has developed more pitches. He's able to sit there and work himself in and out of jams, and he doesn't seem to to get as frustrated on the mound as he used to. He looks like he has much more command over what's going on out there and it doesn't look like really too much rattles him. He looked a little bit rattled in, in the Chicago game where he basically threw the ball away and then he got, you know, the next and then his next pitch was a was a slider that was in the dirt, got by McCann. So I think there is some maturation that has occurred with Justin Verlander. On top of it, him not being able to gas it up to a hundred miles an hour has forced him to rely on different pitches, 
different arm slots, different angles, and, and sit there and work more on getting the movement on his pitches as they cross the plate instead of just blowing them by you. All right, so for opening day, you might laugh at me, but if the weather's going to be probably sub-40, very windy, I have the day off. I don't have any client scheduled, no podcast scheduled to do. Um, the missus wanted to go downtown. I did explore w- what's going down there at Grand Circus Park with what uh, people are doing with the stations and the, and the block parties and stuff like that. Asked uh, DJ Matt A where he's going to be spinning and doing all his stuff. But if the weather's not going to be good, I think the overall opening day plan will be to just enjoy breakfast, do a little bit of the pregame on television, head over to an Art and Jake's or a Buffalo Wild Wings, and just have a couple cocktails, watch the game thoroughly in the confines of an enclosed building, and uh, head home and rest the rest of the day, and maybe use it as a maybe kind of a half day to indulge in sports, and the rest maybe go home and just kind of lay around and be super lazy. Because when you look at it, it is a lot. You know, it's a big endeavor because you're going to have to get up at 8, it's 9 o'clock. It's a long o'clock. day, man. It's a long day. And you know, you text me 7 a.m. and I'm always responding because I'm up early with the kids. So to do that and then to head downtown, to fight traffic, to really figure out what you want to do and lock it down, it's something that I just don't think the missus and I really want to do. So I think the it might happen still where we just say, you know what, screw it. Let's just go down there and experience it if the weather's going to turn around. But it just looks like it's going to be a cold, kind of rotten kind of day overall. So I'm thinking we're going to go to the bar and hang out and watch the game for opening day in 2017 by Macomb County. That's not too bad. It's not a bad deal. I, on the other hand, always seem to be... Because you're right there in the vicinity. It makes it easier when it's a 10-minute drive as yeah. opposed to 35-40. The, the, the problem is I'm usually the one that's tasked with putting it all together. Oh, the organizer, yeah. yeah and Why are you stuck with being the organizer all the time? Because it was one of those things where I did it one year and... It just was, it popped off. It's Now it's, hey, it's your job. You've got to do it. I, didn't, I, I Honestly, after last year, I didn't even want to go down this year. But my one buddy was like, look, I'll drive. You don't have to worry about it. So I was like, all right, cool. And then the wife was on the fence like, oh, I'm going to skip class that day. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go with you. So then I'm like, all right, well, now at this point, I've got to drive because I've got so many different people coming with me. We can't all fit into his car. So at this point, she is now going to class because she has a project that is due. We're going to drive down with my buddy. Um, we'll probably be hanging out at the Fillmore. It's normally what we end up doing. Um, from there, we will go see some adult entertainment, and then uh, I'll probably just end up calling it an early night. the The big issue is I usually go with my with my one cousin, and once he gets going, once he gets tuned up, he's uh, he's ready to go all night. And I'm an old man at this point, and once I get to my fill, I'm ready to go home. I don't care what you want to do, I'm ready to go home. So at that point, either you can roll with me, and you can go back to your car, and then you can go do whatever you want, or Figure out your own way to get to wherever you got to go. Cause I'm out, dude. Cause I just don't. I I don't want to deal with it. I'm I'm done. It's a it's a such a long day, man. The next morning you wake up on Saturday and you're just like, God, my back hurts, my feet hurt, my head hurts. And you know why your head hurts and your guts hurt because you just sat there and you basically boozed the entire day. So it's a very very long day. No doubt about it. Gotta pace yourself, bro. It speaks to your maturity that you'd stay up for WrestleMania 33, (laughs) but not for Tiger's opening day. And I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, man, you know what? At this point in time, I'm only tweeting like one thing about the Red Wings, one thing about the Pistons daily, and we get like twice as much engagement on the tweets about wrestling than we do about Detroit sports. And it's very interesting. And Kenny... You know, my, bo- my boy has said that, you know what, Detroit sports right now is just garbage. You know, let's just talk about wrestling. Let's talk about something else. And it speaks to that, that uh, other type topics are making their way into the mix. And, and the way you look at it is it's a long season, you know, going downtown to celebrate and, and to have some drinks and cocktails. You can do that the rest of the time when the weather's nice. You can go out to the game for 12 bucks, sit out in the bleachers, make your way around, and you can enjoy the experience much better at the ballpark than it is that day because it's packed. You know, everything's going to be overpriced, long lines. And in the end, you know, there's a a good chance the Tigers might lose to Boston that day. You know, Michael Fulmer might go out there and struggle. I mean, it is the Red Sox through no fault of his own. That's an elite club. That's a club with a massive amount of financial resources, and they can do some things. So for me, I look at it as, hey, it's one game of 162. I know it's Detroit's block party, but the way I kind of look at it is, is I can enjoy it for much cheaper at my house and maybe spend 20 bucks as opposed to maybe 20 bucks for one drink. And I'm like, you know what? And if I want to go to the excess, I can call an Uber, and the Uber will be 4 bucks from, you know, 23 Mile and Hayes to, to the crib. Right. You, it, it, so if you want to get crunk and you want to just sit there and do some things at the bar— then you can just go home Knock and closer. Out. Right, right, exactly. And especially, too, with the crowds, it's going to be crowded. And when you're around, you know, 500 to, to 1,000 people in a confined space, maybe all drunk, you don't know what you're going to see. You don't know, you know, at that point in time, who's going to get sloppy when. And it's better to be, you know, close to home. And I think that's what you and I are looking for. And when you find it, it beats everything else. 
by far. Yeah, you just, you know, you got to be smart. It's a, again, it's a long day. It's usually a very busy day. People are all over the place. Uh, nobody quite does it like Detroit does it. And no doubt. The, the police are very aware of how Detroiters do it. So just be safe, be smart. Don't put yourself in a bad spot and just make smart decisions when you're sitting there and you're trying to enjoy your opening day festivities. That's probably the best case scenario. And like you said, you know, there's no reason to sit there and make it less enjoyable for yourself. It's a great day. It's a great day for Detroit sports fans. Do it in the own comforts of your own home. Do it in the comforts of a bar. If you want to go downtown, go downtown. Have a great time. You know, there's no reason for you to be uncomfortable on that day. Just have a blast and just be safe. Don't end up in the sin bin. That's, That's right. A, just don't end up there because that's a big problem. Don't get a ticket like I got a couple years ago. And don't be like KCP, man. Keep it under .08. That's right. If you're going to get behind the wheel. Take an Uber. No doubt about it. Find the Uber app on your phone. And I guess the other piece of advice is the secondary thing people got to do is keep your phone charged. Because you can't use an Uber with a dead phone. And you can't use an Uber if you don't have a phone if you lose it. So word to the wise, keep your phone charged, find those charging stations, or find a friend that will get you home safely. Take an Uber. That's all we can ask for. All right, let's take our first time out, come back. We're going to have a great guest, a guy that's been here before in the studio, Max White from WXYZ, a huge wrestling fan, and we definitely want to get his insights regarding this past weekend's WrestleMania and his thoughts about the current state of the WWE and maybe other things as well. Stay with us. You're listening to Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. On the phone with us right now is a guy that I have worked with closely in the past. He is a huge wrestling fan. You can usually see him whenever wrestle, whenever SmackDown or whenever Raw is in town. You can usually see him sitting front row wearing I'm a Hugger t-shirt. It's Max White from WXYZ, the uh, ABC affiliate here in Detroit. What's going on, Max? Hey, guys. How are you? Outstanding. So, look. There, there, there's no question about it. You are a huge wrestling fan, and we just had probably one of the greatest moments in all of wrestling fandom with WrestleMania that just took place this past Sunday. So we wanted to have you on, get your thoughts on, on this year's WrestleMania 33. I mean, I thought I thought it was a great show for the most part. I, I would give it, if I'm going to put a, a, a letter grade on it, I'm going to give it a B plus, and, and it would go higher if it weren't for probably the last three matches. I think the show started hot, and it had a great, you know, the pre-show was great, too. You had Neville and Austin Aries with a great opener to the show. Dean Ambrose and, and Baron Corbin had a good shot, good start, and I think they kind of showed what they could do last night on SmackDown. And then AJ and Shane just killed it. I actually, I didn't like the way they started that match at first. Um, I felt like it was slow moving, and with the actual the grappling and the wrestling, I didn't think it worked out in Shane's favor, but they ended up stealing the show later on in that match, and I, I loved it. But I thought overall it was a great show. There were some downfalls, and I can get to those a little bit later, but i give it a B-plus just because the last three matches, the uh, what was the, the WWE Championship match between Ray Wyatt and Randy Orton, the Universal Championship match with Lesnar and, and Goldberg, I mean, it was what it was, so I can't really get anything worse than that. And then uh, the, the Taker-Reigns match I think could have been better, but I, I, I also didn't think that would be Taker's retirement. So overall, I'd say B-plus. Max, take us through your WrestleMania day. Do you gather with friends? Do you sit and watch by yourself, uh, mobile, uh, on a television? How do you experience WrestleMania and WWE events when you watch them on television? So I, uh, I've, I've got my younger brother into wrestling a lot over the last two years. And so I, I worked, I actually worked at the, at the station that day and left straight from the station and went to my parents' house and sat down with my brother. We ordered a pizza, had some pop, watched WrestleMania. Uh, my, my older brother came and joined us. And because we forced my mom to watch it, uh, when I go to my parents to see to watch it with my younger brother, she ends up getting involved and is involved in the storylines now. So you make it a, a nice family affair with some pizza, some pop, and, and just uh, and, and call it a night. Watch it seven hours worth of wrestling about. So what was your evaluation of the card as a whole? Many people do talk about the matchups, who was placed where. You know, Adam and I have been yelling back and forth about the fact that AJ Styles was paired up with Shane McMahon when you could have put him against any real wrestler and to, to bring out his real talents. What was your evaluation of the card and the storylines going into WrestleMania 33? 
You know, I thought the card was pretty good. I'm with you on the AJ Styles thing. I mean, he is he is the phenomenal one, and he is probably arguably the, the best wrestler in the company right now. And he, but I think that is why you can put him with somebody like Shane McMahon because he can carry the match. And I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie, Shane McMahon surprised me. He he wrestled the crap out of the, out of that match. It did a lot of things I didn't think would happen, and it went a lot longer than I thought it could either. And and for once, it looks like he's actually throwing punches. Uh, my biggest complaint with Shane McMahon lately has just been it doesn't look like he throws an actual punch. He throws tiny little jabs that like your little brother would throw. But he was, he, you know, it looked like he was throwing some good right hooks and left, left hooks in the mat. Um, I didn't like the addition of Nia Jax to the women's match. I just thought there was no place for it. And when, when my sports crews and Mike Foss and I were actually making our picks, I, I picked her to be the first person eliminated because she was the late pad, and I just thought there was no use for her. And, and then the way the matches worked out, I think both women's matches deserved more time. I mean, you had Becky, Charlotte, and Sasha steal the show at Mania last year. And Bailey, Sasha, and Charlotte could have done it again this year. And I just don't think they had enough time to do it. They kind of, once Nia Jax was eliminated, there wasn't a lot of time for, uh, for, uh, for the three, you know, three of the four horsewomen to make their mark, but like, like the, they did, you know, last year. But other than that, I thought the card was good. I mean, you had Baker Reigns, which I actually thought would have, was a pretty good feud. Uh, like I said earlier, I didn't think it would be his last match. I also didn't like the fact that the Universal title was on the line for Goldberg and, and, uh, and Brock Lesnar. Honestly, it just it, I, I didn't like it. I thought it should have been a title versus title match, as Mike Foss also said to the Jericho Owens feud. Uh, but other than that, I think the card was good and it was well built out. And I like I like the fact that some of these are, are continuing on past WrestleMania. You know, you'll probably have an Austin Aries double match in it. Have, you have Dean Ambrose and Aaron Corbin for the Intercontinental title. I don't know what's going to happen with the Raw title uh, or the Universal title, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, the only other complaint I had was Mojo winning the Battle Royal. They pushed Braun so much in that match, and I mean, it was great to see it eliminated and everyone work together, but I, I feel like the only reason Mojo got the title is because he's friends with Rob Gronkowski, and they wanted to have a celebrity moment at WrestleMania with Rob Gronkowski jump the barrier, get into the ring, play the shoulder tackle to Jigger Mahal. But uh, as, as a whole, I, I did think they did, I, I did think 13... For 13 different matches, they did a pretty good job building up the most of them and putting on a good show. I think you're pretty spot on with most of what you said. And I feel with, with Braun Strowman, it's almost like it's mixed up booking at this point. You have done a great job creating a monster that has gotten over with the crowd. Because I was a huge, I, I absolutely hated Braun Strowman for the beginning of last year. And now as yep. the year has kind of wound down and now we're into 2017 i'm a huge braun Strowman fan i think there's a lot of good with him and i think he's his in-ring work has improved greatly and now the way that they're booking him it, it just makes me scratch my head i feel like every time he comes out and he either has a a face-to-face -face with like a guy like lesnar like was on monday night or in, in, a, in a match like this with the uh with the andre the giant um battle royal you're, you're basically booking him to lose or he looks weak and i just i just don't get it yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I, you know, I liked the where they were heading to with the range Braun feud. I thought that could have done, you know, there was a lot they could have done there. And it, you know, could have been a good opportunity to see a lot of, you know, two good wrestlers and two big, strong guys go at it. And, you know, he showed up on Raw on Monday to confront Lesnar. I was a little weird with that. I mean, I don't mind if he gets right into the title picture. I know Vince McMahon loves giant guys, so it's not really a surprise, but I, I just I would love to see maybe a triple threat match between Lesnar, Reigns, and Strowman for the title. But if, if the rumors are true, then Lesnar's not making any appearances up to payback at the end of the month and isn't even scheduled for payback, so I, the title could be taking some time off. But I think maybe this is the time now where you build a Raw and Raw can see one. When Raw was last in Detroit a few weeks ago, that was the dark match with Raw, was, uh, Roman versus Braun, and it wasn't much of a match. They kind of just destroyed each other with chairs. Roman hit a spear on, on Braun. But it's kind of with Roman playing sort of a heel now and Braun being over with the fans, I think you can you can set that match up that way. One of my biggest complaints with the writing is that you got guys that fans are really behind, like a Bray Wyatt, like a AJ Styles, like the Miz, guys that are what we call over, but it seems like the mm -hmm. storylines definitely kill their characters. So I kind of wanted to get your sense of how did you take away the John Cena mixed tag match? Because you would think if you have a guy that's going to remain on the roster in the Miz, you would, you would put him over and allow him to take that heat and allow him to continue success being an active wrestler on SmackDown. Instead, you have John Cena win the match and then propose 
to Nikki Bella after the match. And I just feel like you had several situations where you could have continued to put guys over that are going to be active wrestlers like an AJ Styles, like a Bray Wyatt, like The Miz. And I think they missed an opportunity to do that. What was your takeaway from the mixed tag match? I kind of knew it was happening, and I thought everybody else knew it was happening. The fact that they had made fun of them not being married and not being together. I think so many people could have said, like, oh, of course, they're going to get seen at the WrestleMania moment. He's going to propose to Nikki in the ring, and that's kind of exactly what happened. Uh, honestly, I don't think The Miz needs it. I think he is so over right now, and he uh, he could be. He, uh, this is arguably some of the best work of his career. He's killing it on the mic. The addition of Marie, of, of Maurice has helped so much, and I would love to see him get involved in the title picture. Um, at some point, and I think he's deserved it with the work he's doing. He's, he's great in the ring, and he's even better on the mic, and I would love to see him hold the title and just say, you know, everybody, shut up, I have the title. He, he brought the Intercontinental Championship back to prominence on SmackDown, and he's, he did a great job with that. I wasn't surprised by it. I kind of saw Cena and Nikki winning because, they, you know, they're, they're going away for a little bit, give them a last win, give the WrestleMania moment of the proposal. Everyone's talking about it, and again, it goes back to kind of what I said earlier with Rob Gronkowski. It wasn't just Sports Illustrated or, or Up Rocks or someone talking about WrestleMania. It was E! Online. It was People Magazine all talking about WrestleMania because of the proposal. So it just garners WWE more attention. Now, given Miz should have won that match with all of the work they've put in and, and how great he's been, but it didn't shock me that Cena won. On the phone with us right now is Max White of WXYZ. You can follow him on Twitter at Max White WXYZ. Now, Max, you, you, when we brought you on, you kind of touched on it a little bit. I want to get your thoughts on that Bray Wyatt-Randy Orton match. I, I myself felt like it was a giant mistake to take the belt off of Wyatt and give it to Orton. It, it almost didn't feel like it made a whole lot of sense. Um, I'm glad this feud is going to continue, but at the same point, I was just I, it left me scratching my head. Yeah, I had really high hopes for that match because it's something that we really hadn't seen before. And I think it played too much into the spooky Bray Wyatt, you know, that aspect of it. I did not want Wyatt to lose the match either. I actually picked Wyatt to win the match. What do you mean? You um, didn't like maggots I, on the on the mat on the mat, or you didn't like worms on the mat, or I didn't, anything I didn't like else? The maggots <laughs> and all of that other stuff. And I felt it took away from the match because those are two great wrestlers. Like those are two guys who who can wrestle the crap out of each other. And it, it would be great to watch, and I think it would be fun to watch. And I also feel like they may have been pressed for time, you know, given that I think they went on probably 1045. And then, you know, they had already been going on. Through, if you're, you're including the pre-show, it's, it's already been, you know, five and a half hours of wrestling. They were probably trying to wrap things up. But I, I do like that it's continuing. I did not like that they took the belt off Wyatt. I thought he was a great champion, and I thought he deserved to have the belt. He's worked so hard for God knows how long in WWE. And I was really happy when they put the title on him. But I think it'll be interesting to see what happens this coming Monday with the roster shakeup and who goes where. Because, like I said earlier, I think Miz deserves a shot. I would love to see maybe a Miz or, or I, you know, Shinsuke debuted last night on SmackDown. He could get involved in the title picture right away. And it kind of seems like they're doing that with the, him coming out for the Miz. But as to as to Wyatt Orton, I thought it fell flat. I thought it was one of the matches that fell flat a lot more than the others. And, and that was actually one of the ones I had highest hope for. Max, I'm curious as to what your stance is on Roman Reigns. Now, arguably, he could be the hottest heel in the entire world, or you could look at him as a guy that, you know what, could carry the company for the next 12 months because of his stature, because of the work that he has already put in. Obviously, his his merchandise is selling hot off the presses. Everything that he puts out there is flying off the shelves, and he's a guy that's being poised to get the big push. Where do you stand on Roman Reigns? Big boo, or do you go, wow, great respect for uh, a top-notch performer? I am a big Roman Reigns fan, whether it's oh. face Roman Reigns or heel Roman Reigns. I am. And I'm, you I'm with you, me. Max. I'm, no, I'm with you, Max. I like Roman Reigns, and I and I think he works his butt off, and he is an, the people who chant, you can't wrestle, are just crazy, because that guy can wrestle, and he can sell, and he is strong, and he's quick, and he knows what he's doing. And I think you put him in the ring with anybody, and they can have a great match. And I think he's underrated, and I, I loved what they did on Monday, that they had him come in the ring, and it was 10 minutes of him just standing there, and the crowd going crazy. And I think the way they booked it was perfect. Everyone hates his mic work. So he went in that ring and he said five words. This is my yard now. And it was perfectly done. And that was the only thing that needed to happen. Did you like his clap back on Twitter where he basically went out there and he said, I could have stood there for another 10 minutes, no problem? Oh, I, I think it's perfect. And I think it's perfect into the character that they're building him into. And I was a big fan of face Roman Reigns. I know everyone said he needed to turn heel. And I got it. Like, he had heelish tendencies. But I think we're getting to that point now where the full heel turn is coming. Maybe not so where he's like hating on the fans, but where he's just, I'm this guy. I'm strong. I'm big. 
I'm the big dog, as, you know, his part of his saying goes, like, this is mine, and I don't care what you think. I'm a good wrestler, so screw you. And I think that's, a, that's the perfect way to book it. The one thing I don't like about Roman Reigns, I can't stand the Superman punch. Otherwise, I'm a big proponent of his. I sit there, I back him up all the time. I want to get your thoughts mm-hmm. on the Undertaker match against Roman Reigns. The writing is definitely there on the wall. Undertaker taking all of his gear off, leaving it in the middle of the ring, and, and him going out the way he went out. Undertaker was is, is pretty beat up. In real life, Undertaker needs a full hip replacement. The guy could hardly stand at points during that match. What were your overall thoughts on that match? I thought it was a good match. I was worried, though, and I think I tweeted before the match that I was worried that, like, he could, just because of how strong and quick and, and good Roman Reigns is, like, I was worried that The Undertaker could have gotten actually hurt, and I know he's old and he's brittle, and by wrestling terms, not, you know, life terms, but he, I thought it was a good match, and I, I loved the fact that they were able to, to get The Undertaker some work in and hit a tombstone, but I think it, it goes to Roman Reigns, too. He's now one of the few people who who kicked out of a tombstone, and, He's one of two people who have beat The Undertaker. And I think if you're going to push Roman Reigns as the top guy in WWE, especially with Cena taking time off, that needed to happen. And I'm glad it happened the way it did. I am mad at The Undertaker's last match because I really wanted to see him. And they teased it a little bit in Detroit when he was when he was wrestling a couple weeks ago. They just they hit the gong, but nothing happened. But that, I mean, it still gave me chills. And I just... I thought the way that they ended it with Undertaker and the standing in the ring, the leaving the clothes, or the leaving the jacket, the hat, the gloves in the ring was the perfect way to send him off. And I don't know if you guys saw later, but the next day when the crew was taking down the WrestleMania set, they actually left all of that in the ring as an homage to The Undertaker, and, or as, as like in honor of The Undertaker. And it was really cool. Like, all, you had all these guys working around the ring, taking stuff down, but then in the center of the ring, full lights on, they had the gloves, the hat, and the jacket just there. And it, yeah. was, it was really cool. I thought it was pretty sweet. That was a, a, a great homage of respect to, to a guy who's basically been there forever. He's one of the only guys who was ever given a, a weird, strange gimmick and was able to turn it into an outstanding career. Moving into the, the new wrestling year, WrestleMania usually marks the end of one year and then begins to kick off the next year. What are you most looking forward to? I'm looking forward to this roster shakeup and seeing what happens. I think... I think you'll probably lose Alexa Bliss to Raw on SmackDown, which from SmackDown, which sucks because I'm a huge Alexa Bliss fan. I really, I don't want AJ Styles. I know there's a lot of rumors going around that AJ Styles is going to go to Raw. I really hope that doesn't happen because I think he flourishes on SmackDown in the smaller show, the smaller roster. It gives him a chance to shine even more, given that guy can wrestle with anybody. I would like to see Baron Corbin get a title shot and finally get a title put on him. No. And I want. <laughs> I, no, see, I'm a big Baron Corbin. <laughs> I am I not. I am not. <laughs> Honestly, I would love to see Roman get the universal title. He hasn't had it yet. He had the title for a little bit, but I think he deserves a, a, a title run. He's got a year ahead of us, and I think WWE is in a good place after WrestleMania, so we'll see what happens. Max, as always, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on here, talking some wrestling with us. Uh, maybe me and you and John, we can get together and uh, and watch a couple episodes of Raw here. Or we can go together to uh, to a show coming up in the future here. Everybody, you can follow Max on uh, on Twitter at Max White W X Y Z. Max, as always, thank you much. Awesome, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right, bone to pick with both of you, Adam and Max. Both of you sitting here having this Roman Reigns love fest, and I sit here and I go, whoa, 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 rewind, reset. I'm one of the guys that would have booed Roman Reigns, not because I think he's a bad wrestler, not because I think the Superman punch is weak, which you made it a great is point. totally weak. You can't put down The Undertaker with the Superman punch. But my thinking is this, is that he's the prototypical guy that's getting the push that many people don't feel that is deserved. You know, here's the reason why many people are not willing to get behind Roman Reigns, is when... When the WWE Universe looks and they go, okay, who's getting the push? And they go, okay, a guy like Roman Reigns is getting the support of the company. You got to remember, dude was suspended for a month. Why? On his own volition for taking pills that he wasn't supposed to take. That's a huge red flag right there. That is not something a leader of a company does or uh, an indication of a guy that you give the top spot to. Are you serious right now? He was suspended. One. That's one red flag. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Real quick. Let me just debunk this, okay? Who, Who runs this company? Vince McMahon and basically Triple H, right? Both of those guys, you see how big they are. You see how large they are. Why do you think they're so large? Yeah, that's all comes in a needle, bro. Both those dudes take massive amounts of steroids, and you know what? Neither one of them got to take a piss test. Do you know why? Because they're part timers. So don't give me this BS that that the that leader of this uh, of this uh, wrestling organization has to be uh, all holy and, and and can't 
I don't know, have a, a little bit of a red flag. And I think he, he got popped for taking, what, like Adderall or something like that? So it's something that most of these wrestlers are on because they all have ADD. So Step one. Okay, step go two. on. I just debunked that. Step two. Okay, now he's the member of the Shield, and you would think that that's the guy that's going to be the leader. I'm more of a guy that thinks Seth Rollins is a much better package all the way around in terms of what he can do on the mic, his in-ring performance, his ability to draw in the crowd. The reason why Roman Reigns is being pushed this way is because he's drawing money. And I guess you could say that that's obviously a plus on his side is that wherever he goes, his merchandise is just flying off the shelves and he's putting a lot of money into the WWE coffers. But in essence, the fans are, you know, you could go with the attitude of, well, if he's getting a reaction, then people, then he, this is a guy that you can do this with and, and make him a top guy is if he gets any kind of reaction. But and you could also say, if we were interviewing Triple H and Vince McMahon, is this is what we wanted. We want to create the heat on this guy, and we've, and we've done a masterful job of creating this heat by what we've done with him. But in essence, my preference with Roman Reigns would be that you don't send him into, right now, a title feud with Brock Lesnar. You've already given him an opportunity to headline WrestleMania now three straight years, and I think the majority of people would argue that if it's not Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns, you could have had Finn Balor come in and get back his title that he never technically lost. And, and the same thing happened with Naomi on SmackDown. She was injured. She came right back and won the title. I would say the fans don't like Roman Reigns because they don't feel like he's worth the top spot. He's not worth the push. Two, the fact is that you probably can't count on him going forward to carry other wrestlers and that he has a limited skill set. In terms of his wrestling ability. Now, Max said, and you say he I can wrestle. Say he has a, I would say he has a limited skill set. He's a limited move set. It, it's basically Superman punch and spear. And that's what, he, that's what he has. The guy can wrestle. He's solid in the ring. He can sit there and he can pretty much go with just about anybody. That one match that we freaked out with Braun Strowman. Have you seen anything that Roman Reigns does to that caliber where he's doing wrestling moves? Now, many people would say that he takes the lazy big man approach, the Hogan approach, where he just kind of moves around the ring, uses his size and strength to be this big bad guy. But in essence, I'm more, and you can tell now, based upon the guys I like, I'm a Shawn Michaels guy, I'm a Bret Hart guy, I'm an AJ Styles guy. Guys that can technically wrestle, like a Kurt Angle. Mm -hmm. I'm not into big guys like a Kevin Nash who just roll around and stick their foot in the guy's face and just throw a couple punches and have the uh, opponent sell to make it look like they're larger than life human beings. And that's kind of where I think the most heat comes in is that, yes, he can wrestle, but he's not doing like suplexes off the top rope. He's not doing other type things where you got like a Sami Zayn flying through the ropes and Austin Aries. Basically, fans get behind wrestlers. They don't get behind big guys that are getting pushed because of their size and stature. Fans get behind personalities. That's what they get behind, okay? Look, Triple H isn't a wrestler, per se. But the dude has a skill set and a here's, moveset. But, but here's the thing. People get behind Triple H because he's charismatic. Roman Reigns isn't great on the microphone. Well, one he, perfect not, example he's, he's for Triple H. He's not great on the microphone. On top of that, you're dealing with, with basically the fallout of John Cena. This is basically John. This is the clone of John Cena exactly. with long hair. That's what that's what is. Good looking guy who's physically strong. He can sit there, he can do a couple big power moves, and you know what? He looks good as the face of the company. Can't talk for 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 anything, whereas John Cena can sit there and cut promos walking around you in a circle. But that's the deal with Roman Reigns. I think he's a solid wrestler. I think he gets a lot of heat because he gets this he 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 was put ahead of Daniel Bryant. So the WWE universe hates on him because Vince McMahon wasn't hearing what the fans wanted. And the way Vince operates is if he hears that you're giving a reaction, doesn't matter if it's good or bad, he's going to take that reaction and he's going to run with it. The moment he hears crickets, that's when he does an about face and he scratches his head and he says, you know what, I've got to change some things. So for everybody who's out there booing Roman Reigns and, you know, sitting there starting their swear chants and, and everything else, cheering him, whatever, he's getting a reaction. That's all Vince cares about is the reaction. And like you said, he's selling merchandise. The only person who sells more merchandise than him is John Cena. That's it. When we went to Raw, I seen a 50-year-old dude spend $55 for a Roman Reigns shield vest. And I was like, what is wrong with you? You're a grown-ass man wearing that. This is bad. Yes, it was horrible. Top of it, he was a little bit chubby, so it didn't look good at all. But again, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? So look, Roman Reigns it, it is solid enough. You're right. I, I agree with you. I don't like the fact that he gets this monster push. I, I feel like it would have been better if it would have just kind of came naturally, if they would have sat there and they would have slowly built him up. And, you know, next thing you know, you're sitting here you're like, why isn't Roman Reigns getting a push? And then he gets the push. Or if it just happened organically. 
You know, like Steve Austin happened organically. Things with The Rock happened organically. And that's why we sit there as wrestling fans, we sit there and we call back to those days with a Stone Cold or a Rock because the way it occurred, it was just like, whoa, this is outstanding. Look, Shawn Michaels, one of the greatest performers of all time. One of my favorites, one of your favorites, right? Shawn Michaels, Marty Jannetty. They were bound to be a mid-card tag team, uh, maybe bubble up, win a championship here and there, and, and that was pretty much it. Like all good tag teams, Vince has to break you up. That's what he does, okay? So... Right from the get-go, I think everybody's seen that there was more of a draw with Shawn Michaels. There's usually the one guy who will go a little bit further in the tag team than the other guy. The one guy's the good worker. The one guy's the charismatic one. Shawn Michaels was the charismatic one. On top of it, he was a really good worker. So Vince put all his eggs in, in the Shawn Michaels basket and was able to make that work for him. Okay? Shawn Michaels got over because Shawn Michaels could sit there, and, and he was helped early on in his career. He was carried uh, by, uh, by Sherry Martell. Um, he was, he had a gimmick that kind of worked for him and then he kind of grew into on top of that, as that developed, his mic skills came along with it and, and he already had a move set. So trying to find a guy like a Shawn Michaels, then you sit there and you kind of push him to the moon. Look, Vince struck lightning in a bottle with Shawn Michaels. It, it just happened. He really didn't have anybody because Hulk Hogan left. He couldn't draw any more money with Hogan. So next guy up, right? Let's just kind of throw some things at the wall, see what happens. You're a little bit of a smaller wrestler, and uh, we're going to put you in a program with Bret Hart. And then him and Bret Hart had heat, and then you had the Montreal Screwjob, which then set off the Attitude Era, which then helped this company continue for the next 10 or 15 years down the line when you eventually got your Stone Colds and your Rocks. So it's all just kind of one of these things where it just sometimes it just happens. And with Roman Reigns, it seems like it's very, very forced. It's not just occurring. And I think that's what strikes fans as being irritant. You know, it's what it rubs you, rubs you the wrong way. Real quickly, a couple more things in our wrestling segment here. What grade would you give WrestleMania overall? We talked heavily with Max about WrestleMania. We got our big thoughts. I would concur with many people. I'd give it a B plus in that you had a lot of situations that were positive. You had a lot of matches that could have done better. My biggest complaint is the Intercontinental title with whatever you feel never needs to go on a pre-show. You need to give that title the respect that it deserves. Greats like Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Daniel Bryan have carried that belt and to stick it on a pre-show, whether you think it's for five minutes, 10 minutes or whatever, you got to give that, you got to give title belts prestige and to have the SmackDown tag titles not even be defended on a pay-per-view is really weird. And overall though, my favorite match probably is AJ AJ Styles because it set off the tone and going first is unbelievable because your job is to go in there and set the tone for the rest of the night and to go 20, 25 and minutes strong. Show. And it was a great match. And Max said it. Shane McMahon was able to do some things and do some moves. And uh, when you have a guy like AJ Styles, that's why he's such a great wrestler. You could take a non full time performer and make him look like um, somebody that can do some things. And that's partly due to AJ Styles and what he can do. So, and when I ask what I'm looking forward to in the next year, I want to see a meteoric rise for AJ Styles because dude has all the talent in the world. And I like what they did on SmackDown with him showing respect to Shane McMahon. And I like the fact that he's probably going to stay on SmackDown, but I'm interested to see what this shakeup is going to be coming up. Everyone's talking about it, like who's going to end up where. But if you have Nakamura on SmackDown, you have to have AJ Styles with him. It'd be a great match. It'd be outstanding. Um, I'd probably give it a B. In It wouldn't be a B plus. It wouldn't be a B minus. If anything, it tended towards maybe more of a B minus. But uh, I'd give it a B. And that's partially because... I felt like it was it was too much. They, they they tried to cram too much into this program. It went on for what seemed like forever. Like Max said, the, the final couple matches really seemed forced and they seemed rushed. Uh, the the women's championship match for for the SmackDown title, I felt like that was rushed really quickly. I was you know I, I basically blinked. The next thing you know, I had uh, uh, Alexa Bliss tapping out to Naomi, and I was like, whoa, that that was quick. I, I think you're right. the The best match of the night was probably the the AJ Styles uh, Shane McMahon match. Um, the Roman Reigns Undertaker match was not very good. The highlight for me, my very best moment, and we haven't even talked about this or touched on this, was the return of the Hardy Boys. Once that, yes. once that raw, <laughs> once yeah. that, once that raw, I got into the broken thing. Yeah. I, looked, I looked it up in the you last couple of weeks. It, yeah. It's pretty good, huh? It's really good. <laughs> it's different. So once the once all the combatants came out for the raw uh, tag match, and then New Day came out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you inside inside the room inside the party that I was at. It was basically like four of us guys, and there were some wives there, and we're all sitting around my buddy's living room, and and we're sitting there watching. There's one guy who's totally not a wrestling fan. 
There's me, there's my buddy uh, Brian, and my bro- my buddy Jay. And the three of us, once New Day comes out, the three of us stand up, and we're all like, whoo, whoo, whoo. And then the music hit. And I marked out so hard. I jumped up. I smacked his fan. I thought I was going to break the globe on his fan. All of us were sitting there jumping around, and uh, me and Brian looked at each other. We ran to each other. It was like one of those things where you see people like running across the meadow, and, and they run, and they hug, and then they fall in love. Yeah, it was basically that. We ran to each other. We hugged. I picked him up. I then fell to my knees, and uh, I just I just marked out for like five straight minutes, and then Jeff Hardy swantons oh. through a ladder, oh. and I'm just like, oh, Damn, my God. Damn, you're 40 years old flipping through a table and, or flipping through a ladder. And, wow. And get this. The night before in ROH, they had sat there and defended their titles. They lost Similar to the moves, Young right? Bucks. Yeah. Exactly. They went through like four tables in that match. So these guys are definitely getting it done, and that, that was my WrestleMania moment. After that, I... Really couldn't have cared less what happened. You know, I like I said, I felt like it went on a little bit long, but I do. I marked out so hard. In, you, in so me. you forgave Jeff Hardy for the whole Victory Road debacle that could have crippled another company? Yeah, man. That, like, that was a debacle. Like, you can't show up high to face Sting. It was not a good look. It, that was, uh, look. 2011 pay-per-view, for those that don't know, it was a nice setup that they had Sting going up against Jeff Hardy. They had to scrap, a, um, they had to scrap the main event pay-per-view. Go and watch it on YouTube. It's amazing. It's, it's ter- amazing. He's high. He, yes, he was out of his mind. Look, like there's no doubt about it. Jeff Hardy has dealt with some drug issues in his past. Okay, so you, for, you forgave him. Okay, so I think he's done it, enough. It, maybe it's, it's one of those things where it, you know, different time, different place. Look, he got the help he needed. Much better person now. So before we move on, you got to check out Ric Flair's last tweet. When you get a chance, you got to check out right now Ric Flair's last tweet that he put out um, on Wednesday. It's his daughter's birthday, and he flashes a tweet of her. And I'm thinking, you know what? She's a good wrestler, but dang, she's a little cutie too in this little bikini that she's sporting. Charlotte is. Look at this picture. Is, it's a is, nice... is, is Ric Flair like creepy old dad at this point? No, they're just celebrating their day off because I think most wrestlers have the day off on Wednesdays, and it's her birthday. So he flashed a picture of her in a bikini, and I'm like, you know what? Get back to the uh, diva days, man. Let her flash some uh, some of her body. She's looking pretty oh, good. Oh boy, it's not a bad picture, right? Look, what I will say is that's I, a perfect pose. I, I, I can't get around. I can't get around the little chocolate chip on her chin. <laughs> I feel like it's a little person that's ready to sit there and talk to me. But she has an amazing body. Like legs for days. She's flexible. She's strong up top. If you catch what I'm saying, I, I just can't get around the 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 birthmark on the chin. It just it messes me up all the time, dude. So what are you looking forward to this year now with the upcoming year now that WrestleMania's passed? I I really I'm interested to see what's going to happen with this shakeup. Um, I do believe that AJ Styles will be going to Raw, and I think that is probably a misstep in, in in the grand scheme of things because he does a great job on SmackDown, and he helps carry that brand. Um, I also think that going to SmackDown, you'll probably get Enzo and Cass uh, to sit there and, and spark some new life into that tag uh, division on SmackDown. Um, I can see some flip-flopping with the girl wrestlers as well. M- might be a good thing for Nia Jax to go to SmackDown. Um, I'm I, Me, myself, I'm tired of her. I, I can't stand her. I'm not a fan at all. Um, I, I, feel like, I feel like she gets the Roman Reigns treatment that you feel, right? Gets the undeserved push because she can't wrestle at all. She's awful. Top bitch, she can't talk on a mic. She's brutal. Excited to see the Revival come up and wrestle on Raw. I'm excited for what is in store for Nakamura. It, it, it is something so moving and, and so powerful to see an entire stadium sing in unison his opening theme song, which is probably one of the greatest openings there is. I get so hyped every time I hear it. I get so jacked. I love his music, and, and I really want to see what's going to happen with him, what's in store for him. It might not be a bad thing if Roman Reigns was to get moved over to SmackDown. SmackDown needs uh, a couple new strong faces on that side uh, because John Cena is leaving for a little bit. So it, there, there's a lot going on. I really want to see what's going to happen next Monday when uh, when everybody kind of gets together. And it, it sounds like it's just going to be trades. It doesn't sound like it's going to be a redraft. Um, just sounds like, hey, I'll give you a, a nickel and a dime and like four pennies. You slide me that nice shiny quarter and let's call it a day. And I, you know, I think this is a good way to maybe strengthen both of these rosters because they both are looking a little bit thin right now, a little weak. Oh, I was, I was it, it, it pumped. I was pumped when Ty Dillinger came out um, on SmackDown. I knew that, I knew that yep. So that, that was cool. That was a really nice moment. Um, Ty Dillinger, for those of you who don't know, like has basically lived in NXT for, I don't know, all of 10 years. And his whole gimmick is he is the perfect 10. And he came out, and the whole crowd, everybody, 10, 10, 10. It was great. 
loved you, it. You know what I kind of want now, just to go outside the box a little bit. I want an enhancement talent tournament, you know, and I think the final so would the be jobbers, Jinder Mahal versus <laughs> Kurt Hawkins. I mean, literally, you had those guys feature, you know, on Raw and SmackDown, and you go, wow, Kurt Hawkins, you really came back to be an enhancement talent. Yeah. Jinder Mahal is a big freak, muscular, and all he is is an, is an enhancement talent. So You think he's on steroids? Oh, he's got to be. Jin- that guy's just rolling doses of DECA. Jinder Mahal. Oh, my God, what a gimmick. He <laughs> he's came so back, cut. And I guess his claim to fame will be, did you see how he tried to throw the beer at Rob Gronkowski? Yes. He messed that up. Yeah, this is so, not good. <laughs> Jinder Mahal versus Kurt Hawkins. That for whole the- bit almost didn't happen. Did you see that? There yeah. was the security guard who apparently yeah. wasn't aware that that was Rob Gronkowski and he was part of the show. The enhancement talent champion of the world, Jinder Mahal. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Where does uh, where does James Ellsworth rank on this? I think is he like he probably- the Intercontinental Champion? I think I like him where he's at, being the manager for Carmella. <laughs> for Carmella? <laughs> <laughs> stick st- Stick him there. That's where he belongs. That was cool to see. The best part of WrestleMania was that 85-yard ramp. If they ever come back to Detroit, hopefully they make it 100 yards. It's I loved so it. Long. It's awesome. It's awesome. Dude, it was awesome. But did you see Did you see half these guys getting winded, yeah. getting down to the ring? Yeah. Like they were breathing heavy before they ever got into the ring. John Cena decides to go at a full sprint. A full sprint. sprint. For from the basically the top of the ramp all the way down, ends up picking Nikki Bella up and basically throws her on his shoulders. And it's like, let's go. And he just goes running into the ring. And I'm like, what are you doing? All right, let's take our final time out ahead. We'll talk about Monday's college basketball final. A new NCAA champion was crowned. And we'll talk to our DSPN bracket winner, Mathis Allen, later on in this podcast. And we'll close it out with a couple quick thoughts regarding the end of the Joe Louis Arena. Stay with us. Episode 191 rolls along. Doc and Jock here for Fanatic U. If you're looking for some sweet sports swag and you love your Detroit teams, and I mean you really love your Detroit teams, you got to check out FanaticU.com and get the coolest gear out there and rock your Red Wing shirt, rock your Lions shirt, rock your Piston apparel. Wear it till the wheels fall off. Michigan, Michigan State, you know what? They got it too. Check out FanaticU. They have six locations all over Metro Detroit. Check them out. FanaticU.com. Yeah, we're coming now. All right, cuz, coming back, talking a little bit about college basketball. It was a great three weeks. I think March Madness lived up to all its billings. A great champion was crowned. Many people walked away from Monday's title game going, man, these games in these huge football stadiums are really tough to watch. It makes for poor shooting games. They brought up a couple years back when Butler played a terrible game and shot damn near, what, like 20% in a, in a, in a final. And many people are like, you know what, you can't have these football stadiums host the NCAA and it's all about money. But the way I look at it is, I thought the two best teams made it to the final. You had North Carolina, you had Gonzaga. It might not have been the best game out there, but I do think the concern regarding the refs was valid. You can't damn near call 27 fouls in the second half. It just ruins the flow of the game. Now, when you look at the letter of the law, When you look at what they were supposed to do, yes, they're supposed to call all these fouls. There was contact. They were legit fouls. But here's what happens when you do that. You had Gonzaga, who has two big men. You have North Carolina. You have a team that plays a style that leads to a lot of fouls being called. But here's what happens. It breaks up the flow of the game. It doesn't make for good TV watching. And so what you have to do is, you can't say you can't change the rules officially, but what you got to do is these referees have to understand how to create flow in a basketball game, which means you don't have to call every single, you know, ticky-tack foul that is, you know, the letter of the law. Let the guys go back and forth, and that that's what makes for a better game. What also makes for a better game is when the game kind of continuously goes long for three to four minutes back and forth without so many stoppages. Many people complained that it was a boring game to watch on television, and they're absolutely right because basically it's Gonzaga goes down, throws the ball inside, foul called, delay. North Carolina goes down, gets the ball inside, foul called. No, let some of this stuff go. Let them play a little bit. Let them dictate some flow. Let three to four minutes go by. Then you could probably get the game higher scoring. But many people have correctly said that. How do you get higher scoring? Call more fouls. David Stern did that in the NBA, and many people have correctly said it, that that he wanted more scoring. So what's happened? More fouls have been called in the NBA. But in terms of entertainment, 
it's a much better product when there's flow up and down in the game and there's less fouls called. I mean, you have a referee named TV Teddy. What does that say? You got people that know the names of these officials and they're getting, you know, nicknames. And this is supposed to be your best crew that earned their way to the top and did this. I think it marred what could have been a better game. But in the end, I think the best team won. If they would have played 10 times, I really feel like North Carolina would win 6-7 to seven in that they're the best team, the best coached, and they, in essence, you know, did what they had to do. And when you look at it, revenge is something that is a great storyline, something that you can use for motivation. And the way they lost to Villanova, I probably should have uh, put more weight being the psychologist in the notion that uh, the devastating way they lost would be a rallying cry. But uh, I thought that Duke was playing the best at the time. But in the end, my brackets, I did horribly because I took a lot of long shots and I didn't take North Carolina. So the wife actually took North Carolina to win the entire tournament. And she was giddy because she watched a lot of the tournament and she won her very first bracket. So so I'm proud of the misses. She did a great job. Yeah, I uh, in my brackets, I somewhere in the middle, usually uh, right around three, four, five, maybe six or seven, uh, depending on what I ended up picking for my eventual champion. Look, like you said, the the issue with the referees, that that's a big deal, okay? 44 fouls were called in this game. And Total, then wow. down the stretch, in, in, in the final minutes, they totally miss a blatant call, yeah, which exactly. could have changed the game. You know, Gonzaga had a shot to win it if you'd make the correct call as the player's hands out of bounds and he's recovering a loose ball instead of calling a jump ball. So yeah, it, look, the, the officials... I don't need them to sit there and create flow in the game, but what I need them to do is to sit there and let guys play. You know, the one thing that I love as just the guy who goes out and plays sports, I love when the referees let you play a little bit. Don't let it get too chippy. Don't let it get a little bit too uh, too intense to where things are going to get kind of dangerous or spiral out of control, but don't sit there and call every ticky-tack thing, you know? But like you said, let some flow develop. One of the best parts uh, of this entire tournament was watching that Michigan-Louisville game go back and forth, back and forth for three-minute, four-minute stretches. You know, Michigan would get the ball, dribble down, shoot. Either it'd go in or or they'd miss, whatever. And then Louisville would come back down and they would shoot or it'd go in or it'd miss, whatever. And then it would just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, eventually there'd be a foul that was called. But you would get these stretches in the game where... It was you were kind of on the edge of your seat because you're like, okay, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? You know, is Michigan going to be able to defend Louisville? What's going on here? Is Louisville going to be able to score? You know, is Louisville going to be able to force a turnover? What's going on? You know, that's that's a that's a great part about about basketball is when you get into that mode where it's up and down, back and forth, and to have 44 fouls called in in your championship game. That's unbelievable. That's uh, it, it ruins the game, and like you said, it makes it a very, very difficult watch. It, it's it's hard to sit there and enjoy something like that. So suffice it to say that the uh, Kurt Angle You Suck Award goes to the NCAA refs? Yeah, I mean, for sure. It has to, right? Look, they totally ruined a, a great spot, a great moment. It's a championship game. What are you doing calling that many fouls, you know? And over weak stuff. BS. <laughs> This is so great. Hall of Famer. That's right. Love it. NCAA. You suck. You suck. <laughs> Outstanding. Well played. I like how you had that in the bag there. It was good work. Look at you doing some show prep. You like that? I do. I do. That was yeah. Nice. Well done. Yeah. Nothing's getting deleted off of this podcast. You know that? <laughs> But uh, it was a good overall three weeks. Everyone liked it. Everyone thought that it's it was always a good fun, isn't it? It's a good three weeks. It kills. You know what? It's a great gap between the end of football and the beginning of baseball. The NCAA tournaments when a good time. If you're one of those people that really misses football, and you're one of those people that doesn't want to watch college basketball all the way through, you know, right when the combine ends, peek into college basketball. That'll get you through right up until the time baseball starts. It's like your primer for for baseball is pretty much what it is. Get you get you kind of get the juices flowing, as they say. All right, cuz, let's get uh, Mathis Allen on the line. He won our Detroit Sports Podcast Network Bracket Challenge, and he did a great job. He was dominant, and he was pretty much wire to wire after, I think, the second round. He had a great bracket, and we'll figure out what he did in our second annual Detroit Sports Podcast Network Bracket Challenge, and this is the second time. Tyler won it last year, and this year Mathis won it, so I'm interested to pick his brain and get to know him a little bit. And talking to our fans is always something that I enjoy. We'll get to Mathis right up next. The respected madman. Hey, this is Mathis Allen. You're listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast. If there's no other podcast that you listen to, listen to this one right here. As advertised, on the phone with us right now, 
Every year, we have a Detroit Sports Podcast Network bracket, and we open it up to the supporters, our great supporters that follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And this year, the winner is Mathis Allen, and he's a you know, strong supporter, likes a lot of our comments on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. Mathis, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Congratulations, man. You filled out the bracket, and early on, you know, when we got to the second and third rounds, you had already established a lead. Tell us a little bit about how you went about filling out your bracket this year. Okay, yeah. Um, this year, I was kind of following the, lead, the how everything was going, so but I didn't really, I didn't really have a good sense of exactly who was good and who was bad. So I just, I decided to um, first fill out my bracket, just going whoever had the highest seeds because. I tried this in previous years and it worked pretty well. But then, but then I looked at some of them as like, okay, some of these are going to be upsets. Let me try to get some of the upsets. So I was able to guess a couple of the upsets. Right, it was one of the. I think I correctly guessed one of the six to ten upsets. And then I got was able to figure. I I also got Michigan going into the Sweet 16 and then ending there on time. So that helped out a lot. It also helped that I just happened to pick the right um, team to be the champions, and I think I also picked the right championship game um, in my bra- in my bracket. Because I'm pretty sure I had Gonzaga and um, and uh, North Carolina as the championship game, and then North Carolina winning it all. So that that one was just luck. Um, I just I just felt like North Carolina, it was North Carolina's year this year. So that's how I built my bracket. I assumed that Michigan was going to get as far as it did based off of how it did on the Big Ten championship game, like how they just how they just seem to have had a huge momentum from that. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's going to carry in the, in, the, in the tournament some. Well, congratulations. So for those that are listening now, tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you an Eastsider, and how did you come across our podcast? Well, I'm originally from Grand Rapids. I went to, I went to Kettering University, and then um, now I'm working at GM. So I was on the west side of the state. Now I'm on the east side of the state. I first heard you guys um, because for one of my assignments at GM, I had to take, I had to take like hour long drives every day. So I was like, okay, I need to start listening to some podcasts so I don't get bored and just listen to all my music. And that's how I found you guys. And I was like, because I was starting to get more into um, football. It was 2014, so the Lions were really good. So I was like, okay, let me get more into the sports podcast. And that's how I found you guys. I, I really enjoy you guys' talk a bit more. Your, how how a that you're frank and, and b that you talk about all of Detroit sports so I can get I can get a better I got a better understanding of how all the Detroit sports were doing but but yeah like I said mainly um, football Lions all the way got season tickets and everything oh a Lions season ticket holder so you like the sarcasm that we roll with every Sunday during the football season trying to ride the, <laughs> trying to ride the roller coaster of a Lions fan oh man. Each and every year, the Lions jack up the price, man. You're taking the money out of your wallet and paying it? Honestly, so that just covers it, so I don't have to worry about it. It's not that big of a deal for me. What are you thinking about? Uh, where do you stand on the pay Stafford or cut Stafford side of things? Because you know that whenever, oh, yeah. we, whenever we start that on the Twitter page, you see it. You see all the reactions we get. We can just say Stafford, and we have some fun there on our Twitter page. Yeah, I, I'm definitely for Stafford. I mean, when you see... One thing people, I think people will take for granted is like how much of a competitor he is. Those eight comeback wins, but then also that infamous, that famous Browns game where he where he got hurt and then but through but through the game winning touchdown, and then the last drive, um, he has that fire in him. He wants to win. He can win. You just need to give him more of the right support. And so cap keeps going up. He's, um, he's gonna. Somebody else is gonna be come, is gonna come after him and get paid even more. I mean, to me, he's worth it. And I'm pretty sure Bob Quinn sees sees that too. He understands the value of a quarterback, and maybe he make he he helps Stafford. He gets Stafford to not get paid so much more, but he'll be he'll will be. But we definitely either pay him a respectable amount of money for an extended period of time. Because do you really want to be? How the Texans and the Broncos are with like sure they've got great defenses, but you still need a quarterback to helm that. In fact, I looked up who was our longest tenured quarterback, and apparently we haven't had one that lasts more than seven years. 
since the 70s. So trust me when I say I really want to keep Stafford. He He's certainly proven himself to be good enough to me. I just don't see why people are so antsy and thinking that quarterbacks are just easy to get. Like, you can just find a good quarterback. Like, you can just find a good corner or a good defensive lineman or something like that. It's not that easy. Man, good stuff. I can appreciate that side of things, but you obviously know the other side of things, being that he's been the quarterback and he still has yet to have a playoff win. But this year has got to be the year where we say, okay, this is your final exam. you got to get us to the postseason, and you have to have that playoff win for probably the coach and the quarterback. Are there other sports that you follow in town, too? It sounds like you like all the sports. Yeah. The one I follow the next closest would be uh... – the Pistons, I got season tickets for for them this year too. Um, expecting they that would be that they would be uh, good, and plus they were close close by to where I live. Since one of those things is not good, it's not true this year, and the other one's not going to be true next year. I'm probably not going to be um, re upping my season tickets for them. No, understandable. So for those that are filling out a bracket, what advice would you give people filling out an NCAA bracket to give them a chance to win and have some success? My thing is. Like I said, first start out with all the with all the high seeds like progressing because that's it's just more likely to happen. It's more likely that a, the one seed is actually going to get all the way to the final four. But that from that from there on, try to figure out who, who might who might have gotten hot recently and who could possibly ride a streak into into the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. And don't worry too much about guessing all the correct upsets because if you do that, I feel like you start you you can lose a lot of points that way because if you just have if you eliminate like a big team like a like a four four C too early that that can just that can ruin your whole bracket. Try not lower seeds getting to to the championship because of, because if they get eliminated then that just ruins your whole bracket. A number one seed is less likely to get eliminated too early on, but like two but like you know two seeds unfortunately can lose their could lose their first game, as we saw with Michigan State last year. On the phone with us right now, Mathis Allen. You can follow him on Twitter at KHMakerD, a.k.a. The Respected Madman. You can find him on our Twitter page, always commenting and liking and retweeting our stuff, which is always greatly appreciated. I guess we'll end on this because I'm really curious. You are a Pistons supporter. You went to a lot of the games this year, and many people are complaining about Reggie Jackson, Andre Drummond, Stan Van Gundy, the mix he put together. What was your take this year watching a whole heck of a lot of basketball that many people will say is subpar? What, who's to blame for this, and how would you go about if uh, if Mathis was the GM to try to fix this mess? Okay, so problems is Andre Drummond. He's supposed to be the star of this team. At least that's what everybody built. That's what he built as. But he does not bring that competitive fire. I'm not necessarily saying that he's not competitive. He doesn't want to win. I don't want to say that. But he needs, but he doesn't bring that energy, that drive that I want. That like I want to win or we want to win. You don't feel you don't feel that from them sometimes. And like you only do really get like one or two draft picks, and you gotta hope that you have to draft high and. All this and all this other stuff. So it, they need to find somebody who is. They need. They need a superstar. It's most likely going to be Cavs Warriors, Cavs Spurs. So we need to have. Um, we need to wait and get uh, a superstar. We need to find a superstar. And until then, we're just kind of wasting our time. Mathis knows his stuff. Thank you so much for being an active member on our Twitter page. Thank you so much for, you know, all the great comments. We look forward to many more in the future. You did a good job here. I'm really appreciative of those that follow us, and it means a lot that you entered the contest. And, hey, if you're going to enter something, might as well take it down. Mathis, great stuff. All right, thank you. All right, thanks to Mathis Cuz. Let's close this podcast out. Unfortunately, you know, the season for the Red Wings didn't go as planned, but the big storyline is not going to be how the Red Wings are going to come back. That's going to be looked at after the season. Right now, many people are going to look to Sunday, the final game versus the Devils, the closing out of the Joe Louis Arena. And the way I look at it is this. It's about time. It's been a long year, but it's been a kind of year where you look at it and you go, you're not as devastated. We are giving the Red Wings a little bit more respect, and we're kind of giving them the respect that they deserve for the past 25 years, getting to the postseason. And that's kind of what it's been. You see a little bit on our Twitter page and the reaction that we get about people that are like really pissed off regarding the moves. But I do think more people that are messaging us 
and interacting with us are really reflecting going, you know what? The Red Wings gave us 25 really good years. And it kind of has an end of an era kind of feel. And I think it's going to be culminated by what happened Sunday, where we close out the Joe Lewis Arena, they finish out the year, and then it'll be the next chapter opening up where one closes. And the next chapter is going to be really decided by what Ken Holland does, what the organization does to try and rebuild and get the wings back to glory. We think that it should have happened maybe three to four years ago, and you should have closed the chapter then. But hey, when you close out a building, you reflect on what's happened in that building. A lot of great memories from Stanley Cups to fights to classic overtime games to a lot of great hockey moments were at the Joe. And you can find them all over. There's going to be a lot of coverage for that day. But when I look at it, it was a great building for the time. And for those that were Red Ring fans, you really got an opportunity to grow and watch the wings at the Joe Louis Arena. But when one door closes, another one opens. I'm actually super thrilled much more to see what this new arena is going to bring than I am reflecting on the Joe. It had its time. So no uh, no fond memories of Joe Louis for you? A lot of memories in terms of, you know. Concerts, anything? Not too many, no. I mean, wrestling yeah. events for me. Okay. For me, wrestling was the thing that bonded me to Joe Louis more than the, the, the Red Wings because I didn't go there personally. But just watching from afar... I've enjoyed the the Wings and grew up there, you know, the series versus Edmonton, the come up, the losses versus Toronto, the losses versus San Jose, you know, the seasons where they, they earned so many points and got the record, but then would be bounced out. And then you thought about Steve Eiserman and where he, he ranked until he won the Stanley Cup. So it was a great era. But for me, it's kind of closed in the last three years. And the way I look at it is I'm now ready for the next chapter. For me, I've already gotten to that point. When the Red Wings were no longer Stanley Cup contenders, I've been now looking at what's next. And this is a kind of what we call like a transitional period where you have Zetterberg as the captain and you're trying to find the next wave of talent. So for me, I've already closed the chapter. It's just now the Joe Louis Arena is catching up in terms of people saying, okay, let's close out this building. Let's reflect a little bit more. I've already reflected quite a bit. I mean, we do a weekly podcast, so we've thought about this, looked at it already. I've experienced the memories. I've already thought about it with the 10-year anniversaries of the Cups and the 20-year celebration. So we've done that quite a bit. For me, I'm just looking forward to the opening night of the next building is where my mindset is at. I got gotcha. you. Um, look, Joe Lewis was a complete hole, right? It, it, okay. it, it was a dump. Yeah, um, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It was rushed when they put it together. Uh, there were they, they never took into account where it was placed right there along the water. It, it had great sight lines, and you felt like you were right on top of the action, which was great. Getting up and down those stairs was treacherous, but Joe Lewis was our hole. It was our dump. You know, It was one of those places that had, if you're a hockey fan, it had the best ice in pretty much all of the NHL. It was one of those places where if you were a Red Wing fan, you got to see them lift cups. It was one of those places where where that streak of them not winning Stanley Cups ended. It's one of those places where you got to see heroes like Steve Eisman, Brendan Shanahan, sit there and... Brett Hall, do, Dominic Hasek. Do what they did. I mean, you basically had Claude Lemieux get his comeuppance on that ice, you know? It, it was a place for, for great moments. And that being said... Uh, I have a couple that I will remember, two in particular. Um, both of them were with my father. Uh, one was my one of my very first Red Wing games I've ever went to. Uh, it was back in 1992. Uh, it was a 4-4 tie against the Buffalo Sabres. And as you know, um, I'm a huge Steve Eisman fan. He was my guy, right? He was my dude. Uh, Steve Eisman ended up scoring a hat trick in that game. One of them came on a uh, penalty shot. There was a puck that was flipped up. We were seven rows off the boards. So there was a puck that was flipped up, and it landed in row five, just a little bit over from me. I almost caught the puck. Um, so that was kind of a that was kind of a cool moment. Um, I've got, like, this collector card thing that they gave you when you came through the door, and my mom's got different stuff, like, inscribed in it. And, you know, basically she wrote down the box score for me and how many goals Stevie Y had and kind of where we sat in the section and all that jazz. So that was pretty cool. The other one was when the Red Wings sat there and they beat the Chicago Blackhawks to go on and win the Stanley Cup. Uh, we were able to get playoff tickets, me, my sister, my wife, uh, who at the time was my girlfriend, and we got tickets for my father, and uh, we took him to that game. They weren't great seats by any means, um, but it was just to, to be in the house and to sit there and see them take on this up-and-coming Chicago Blackhawks team, which I looked to to the guys who were sitting to my left. They were Blackhawks fans, and they were disappointed. But I told them, I said, hey, don't worry. You guys are going to be there in the next year or two. And then, look, turn around, and basically it's been a dynasty for Chicago. So it was th those two moments will stick out in my memory pretty much forever. 
Both outstanding games. One was a tie, one was a win. I enjoyed the Joe. Like I said, it, it was a dump, but it was our dump. Nothing gets me more uncomfortable than having to go sit there and pee basically in a bathtub. Uh, I don't generally like sitting there standing next to dudes where we're basically, our balls are side by side. Um, that's always yeah, really, close really, and personal. Un- yeah, it's always really uncomfortable and I always get pee shy. Am I the only one who gets pee shy? Do you ever get pee shy? I get no. pee shy all the time. I don't know. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. I just sit there and I stare at the wall and I start singing a song trying to get myself to go. It's really awful. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, look, it was the Joe, baby. I like the Joe. It was a dump. It was our dump. I'm going to miss it, I guess. I'm really interested to see what this new stadium has in store. It sounds like it's going to come with all the amenities Joe Lewis probably should have had or could have had. You got to remember, look, greats like Gordie Howe, Ted Lindsay, Terry Sawchuck, they, they skated on that ice, man. That was their place. They called that home. And uh, if you're a fan of the NHL, you know what those names mean. You know who they are. We got to see guys like Steve Eiserman. You said Brett Hall, Brendan Shanahan. Dominic Hassig, we got to see Hall of Famers skate on that ice as well. You know, Wayne Gretzky came here and, and skated on that. It'll be missed, but uh, I look forward to uh, bigger, better, and brighter. Great podcast, sir. Man, it was massive. We talked Tigers, talked wrestling, talked a little bit about our memories from Joe Lewis Arena. Good stuff, sir. Trekking towards episode 200, as always. It was a fun time. Thanks to everybody that's been supporting us and checking out our project. And like always, to support us, go check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc, John Macaroon. We greatly appreciate it. And if you like what you're listening to, go over there to iTunes and leave a five-star review. It definitely helps us out. Go Tigers. Can you play a game? This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. (laughs) Didn't quite work out. And all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me.